Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's very early, but what a beautiful morning it is. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, right, okay. Um, well, as Angela said, I'm from uh, a magazine in the UK called Ruler. Um, has uh, everybody heard of the magazine? And c Could I just have a show of hands? Is, who, who's a cyclist in, the, in this audience? Um, that's almost everybody. In fact, I think that is everybody. And who here actually works in the media in, 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 and, and graphic design, perhaps? Let's broaden it slightly. Okay, good. Okay. I just, it's just interesting because I, I wanted to know how to pitch this. And, uh, and when uh, Richard asked me to come and talk to you about freedom, um, my first reaction was uh, what I'd really like to talk about is the free press. Uh, but that's a subject that I could not cover in 20 minutes. So I kind of scratched that one. And I thought probably what I'd talk about is... is, is um, is my idea of editorial freedom. Um, and that comes about to uh, this statement here, which is, uh, which is about passion. And if, uh, if everyone here is a cyclist and uh, enjoys the idea of riding a bicycle, you probably understand what I'm talking about when I say that cycling to me is, 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 is all about freedom. Um, the idea that you can just get on a bicycle and ride is, is possibly, uh, for a human, the, most, the, the, the freest it can get. So um, that's kind of my, my brief introduction to the, the idea of freedom. But um, I'm, uh, just, to, just to clarify who I am, uh, I was the founding editor of Rouleau magazine uh, in 2006. And um, I was working for a big publisher uh, previous to that. I'd worked for big publishers for about 10 years. And in 2006, I was thinking about uh, the idea of breaking free from that. Um, because uh, I was getting increasingly frustrated with working in uh, cycling magazines that pr presented a fairly formulaic uh, approach to, to the media. So what I was looking for is to, uh, is to, change, uh, to change that. And some of my colleagues and friends that worked in the cycling media um, were of the same, uh, the same sort of philosophy, that something did need to change. And we launched uh, Ruler magazine uh, in 2006 and this is the cover of issue one and at the time it was sort of received with uh, with some s with some sort of quizzical uh, responses but also uh, I think it was quite well received because we we decided that we'd start with a blank sheet, sheet of paper if we if we could have a blank sheet of paper and start again what would we actually do and and we came up with this idea that we should we should we should concentrate on an alternative view but most of all <coughs> we would approach it with the idea that we had total editorial freedom. That is, we could actually put in it whatever we wanted. And <coughs> the ideas for editorial freedom for me, uh, when we were first coming up with the ideas for, for Ruler, came from, uh, from, from looking backwards. Because I believe it's interesting, walking around this museum this morning, when you see some of these beautiful old bicycles and you see some of the ideas that were incorporated then, and you sort of think, that's the sort of thing that should, should be happening now. There's some great ideas that, we, that, we, that we've, we've left behind. And in the same vein, I was looking at uh, magazines from the early part of the 20th century, and in particular, um, Time Life magazine, Picture Post, uh, Parry Match, VU. These are sort of magazines at the time that were, that were very free, in actual fact, to do basically what they wanted to do. And obviously, it's a... Um, the, uh, the reportage magazines in particular were, 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 were really well received. Um, I mean, these didn't sell in their tens of thousands, not even their hundreds of thousands, they sold in their millions. And they were very, very popular. And I look back at these magazines, and I, I'm an avid collector of them, and I still look back on them and think that there's more freedom then in the magazines than there is now with the current stock of consumer magazines that we're, we're sort of dealt with um, from the newsstand. 
<coughs> and I also looked at um, magazines from the 70s and 80s, in particular the, the, the Sunday supplements where you'd have 10, 15, 20 pages of, of a, um, a photo story. And I realized that, you know, the, the just wasn't, that just wasn't happening anymore. <coughs> I'm also quite an avid collector of, uh, of, of old cycling magazines, as I'm sure you can imagine. And um, the thing that w was striking and the thing that many of, say, many of my colleagues and, and, and friends said that they were really sophisticated. You know, they, 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 had, they, had, um, they, they got into the depth of the sport and they, they also presented it in a really stylish way. It was, it was simple, it was, but it was beautifully presented. And a lot of that was down to the fact that they, that, that they just kept it simple. Um, this magazine here, Career Sporting Cyclist, is, uh, was, was edited and, and started by a guy called Jock Wadley, who's, who's uh, sadly no longer with us. But um, he just had a brilliant eye, and he also travelled the world on his bicycle to report back from these huge races from the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia. And in the 1960s in the UK, 1950s and 1960s, that was unheard of. You know, nobody really knew about the Tour de France because everything was very insular. So he opened up the eyes of an audience in the UK to, to, to this wonderful world of, 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 of cycle racing. And then uh, as, as uh, so Sporting Cyclists closed down, he worked on international cycle sport. And in the UK, that was, um, that was the first colour magazine to show the Tour de France in its true glory. I mean, you know, we have to put it in perspective. Back in those days, they didn't, obviously, there was no internet and there was very, very few TV programmes about, about the sport, sport of cycling, about any sport, for that matter. So when we launched um, Ruler, we were quite fortunate in that the independent mag magazine market was just starting to sort of take hold in the UK. Um, I mean, everybody I'm sure is familiar with Monocle magazine, started by Tyler Brule. Um, and we were very excited about magazines like Fantastic Man. I don't know if you're familiar with that magazine, but it's, it's, it's a beautifully presented magazine, which does kind of take its design cues from those older style reportage magazines where the story is everything, and uh, they give uh, stories space to breathe and to, and, and to come to life. And lastly, uh, Photo 8 magazine, which at the time was uh, uh, quite a regular pho photographic magazine, which again uh, took that idea that you know, photo stories and, and, um, and images should be, should be given time and space to breathe. <coughs> so saying that uh, consumer magazines can kind of get trapped in a, in a, in a, in a formula, in, a, in an idea that, that, that this is what the reader wants to, to see. Personally, I think is, 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 is not the right approach because I'm sure everybody here is, is, is well aware about wh what is available on the market to buy and to actually be told what to go out and buy is kind of slightly patronizing. So we wanted to slightly change that. Um, so our, our response to that, <coughs> Um, within Rouleur was basically we, we decided that we wanted to tell the stories behind the brands um, along with telling the stories of bike racing and the stories behind the actual behind the scenes of bike racing the most important thing for, for, for me personally was to actually tell the stories of the individuals that started uh, the bike companies and that actually worked behind the scenes to create the bicycles that we ride um, this cover story that we uh, that we ran this was issue five of the magazine so this is uh, 2007 I think was uh, this is Dario Pegaretti's workshop in Caldonazzo in in the in the Italian Dolomites and as you can see it was a beautiful morning in the workshop and um, I think when Richard asked me to come and talk about freedom I think this is the sort of thing from a point of view of creative freedom that that, that kind of summed it up for me because Dario uh, decided that he wanted to make these cut out birds and put them on the window of his studio and it, it sums up the guy himself because he he uh, he really doesn't see the idea that you should be tied to a market tied to a way of doing things and he said this to me when we were when we were talking um, I think it's stupid to follow the market it's more fun to make the market and he uh, he very much does his own thing I mean the way he builds bicycles is is unique to him and it isn't following a market it's not carbon fiber it's not the latest gizmo it's 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 very much how he sees making bicycles and as a result um, the products speak for themselves I mean Pegaretti bicycles I mean he's his his uh, 
his reputation is is cemented in 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 cycling i mean just a little bit about dario um because he doesn't really big himself up that much he he worked for um a contractor making bicycles for pinarello and for carrera in the sort of uh the mid to late 80s and dario built bikes for miguel and Jurain, for claudio Cipucci, for all these huge stars and he made them himself specifically um to their requirements and obviously when you're working for a contractor and you're working for a bigger manufacturer these things just don't get talked about eventually Dario decided that he'd had enough of that so he decided that he would break free he would set himself free and start building bicycles for himself the way he wanted to build them <coughs> this uh, this takes me on to Japan I don't know why it takes me on to Japan but it does and um, we visited Japan a, few, a fair few years ago and what's interesting about Japan is the culture of cycling is just completely alien to what we're used to here in Europe. Um, in, uh, in Japan cycling is a, is, uh, as a sport is mostly about the Kirin racing and the Kirin racing is, uh, is a very specific form of, uh, of bicycle racing in basically uh, established for gambling. For, for, for um, a way of making money for local communities to build facilities. I mean, it was started after the Second World War, so when Japan was, was with the economy was very, very low. And the whole idea of it was to, um, was to, um, was to raise money for good causes, essentially. But now it's a big business, it's a huge business. But the people behind that story, in the same way that Dario is behind road cycling in Europe, are a bunch of guys who are kind of artisans and craftsmen that, that make the bicycles for the Kirin races. And in a kind of interesting twist of, 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 of retro um, technology, if you like, they have to make their bicycles from steel in the traditional way, um, like some of these bicycles here. They're not, they're not riding the latest carbon fiber tech that, that the guys would be riding at the World Championships or Olympics. They're very much riding a basic bicycle. And as a result, um, Yoshiaka Nagasawa, um, we spent an evening with, um, with Nagasawa at his workshop, and um, he starts building bicycles at 10 o'clock at night and works through the night because he doesn't want to be disturbed by the telephone or by people visiting. Um, he wants to be free, basically, to just get on with what he, d what he wants to do. And I don't think I've ever met a more belligerent man than, the <laughs> than Nagasawa. Because if you ask him to build you something different, like if you say, oh, I want a road frame, I want something that I can ride to work or, or anything like that, he'll say, no, uh, all I build is track frames. I build Kirin frames and that's it. I mean, he has built road frames, but it's, it's, it's the whole idea that he, he has this sort of belligerence and, and refusal to do anything other than what he's used to. And in a sense, that's a freedom, I think, because once you've decided what you want to actually do and you don't want to break, break away from that, um, it allows you an awful lot of freedom to, uh, to, to be true to yourself. I don't know how I'm doing for time. I think, oh, well, there's a little clock on here. 11 minutes. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone can read this. It's probably a little bit small. <laughs> um, a lot of those things that we put into the magazine about brand, um, they've actually, they've, this, this tweet that was put up earlier this year um, confirms to me that I think we really got it about right. And I'll read it out because you probably can't read it from where you are, but it says, just got my first copy of Rouleur magazine. Too wordy, not patronising enough, and how will I know what to buy? <laughs> and I, I, I actually think that's the best thing that anyone's ever said about the magazine because, um, because it's, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of what I set out to do when we started the magazine. So in that respect, um, it's a job well done. But what about bike racing? Because essentially we are about bike racing. The magazine was set up to be a, uh, a reportage magazine about cycle racing. And um, it's a bit of a tricky one because obviously bike racing is about winning races. Um, but we called the magazine Rouleur and the Rouleur isn't necessarily the guy that you'd expect to be winning a bike race. Not always. And the reason why we called it Rouleau is because it's about the person that does the work. It's about the hard grafter. It's about the person in the team, the team captain, the guy that pulls everybody together. 
And this is the uh, a photograph from the um, from the second issue that we w that we put together, and it's a photograph by a, uh, an English photographer called Ben Ingham. And the interesting story about this is that I'm I'm pretty certain that this is the first photograph he took of a bike race. Um, because I was with him when we when we did this shoot. This is in Nokkera in 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 Belgium in West Flanders. And for me, it's one of the most perfect pictures I've ever seen of a bike race. And I, and I'll explain a little bit why I think that. Um, these guys here at the front, uh, this guy looking over his shoulder, they'd been away in a break for 100 kilometers maybe. And they'd had a huge gap at one point and the gap was coming down. And you can see the peloton or what was left of it chasing up behind. And there's this guy in between the two trying to bridge across to the, the guys at the front. And if you know about bike racing, you'll know that that is unfeasibly difficult to do. You know, once the race is in the final 20 kilometers, because it was, the, the speed is really high and to bridge across here that's a that's a that's an awesome feat and to me I don't know what uh, you guys think but it feels to me like you're in the race and the whole sort of ethos and idea of what we were doing with Ruler when we started was to make the reader feel like that they were in the race um, so you know that's um, to me that 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 did that did the job <coughs> And I've talked a little about, about the small brands, about the little guys like Nagasawa and like Pegaretti. And uh, those guys are so important to me personally, but also because you know, they, they share the same, if you like, they share a very similar philosophy to quality and to, to uh, belligerence, if you like, but certainly to doing what they want to do. But what about the big fish? Now, this is, uh, this is actually the headquarters of Shimano, which is you know, the, the biggest bicycle component brand in the world. Um, but also one of the biggest um, uh, fishing tackle uh, um, manufacturers too. And what's interesting about Shimano is it's not what you expect. Uh, I went to Shimano with a lot of ideas about what Shimano would be. I thought it would be full of computers and you know, boring people walking around doing monotonous and tedious jobs. But it's far from it. It's absolutely the opposite of that. Um, and the guy who, who now runs Shimano, Yozo Shimano, uh, second, second generation, second generation uh, from the Shimano family to run the, uh, to run the business. He's a, a really engaging guy, um, fascinating man. And um, we talked for quite a long while in this beautiful office in the, in the, in the, in the headquarters in Osaka. And, <laughs> and he just said, really, all I want to do is just go fishing. And I, I just thought that was brilliant because Here's a guy who's sort of almost trapped by this responsibility. The family, you know, to in, in Japanese culture, the family is really important. But also, if you run a business, the responsibility, the sense of responsibility is huge. And the sense of responsibility on this guy um, is huge. And he takes it all in his stride, but he did say, I just want to go fishing, which I thought was really uh, quite moving. And going back to the other side of the world, coming back over to Italy, where we went to interview two, um, uh, Valentino Campagnolo who is the, um, the son of uh, Tullio Campagnolo, his picture's up on the wall here, ominously looking over his, 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 uh, his charge who's taken, taken on um, the, uh, the helm of Campagnolo. I mean, what a job to actually have to take on. Campagnolo in the, the first 50 years of, of, their, of their life were, won everything, you know, I mean, and up until fairly recently they would win everything. But he said to us, um, almost quite reg regrettably with, with so many victories there are risks and I think what he meant by that is that it, it, when you're winning it's great, you know, it's fine, it's, it's brilliant to be winning but there's also the risk that you, 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 you take it for granted and I think Campagnola did, I mean I think if anybody knows the history of Campagnola and how Shimano have sort of taken over the, that, that mantle of being the leaders in, in, uh, in, in the bike racing world he sees that r as a risk to his business. Um, and risk is a really interesting thing to talk about, especially when it comes to creative freedom. Because to him, that risk is obviously a threat to his business, and he has to react to that. But I think risk is the one thing as, um, as an editor and as a, um, a creative, is the one thing that if you don't take risk, you're, you're in a chance, you're in an opportunity to be left behind. <coughs> And um, what I mean by that is uh, editorial, um, editorial direction is, um, is a risk. And 
the only risk as an editor that I have is asking people to do things. And I hope you're <laughs> following me here, but what, what I'm trying to say is um, we have a, a band of contributors that contribute to the magazine, around 30 photographers and around a similar amount of writers. And um, what I say to them whenever we commission an article and when they ask me, what, what, what do you want me to do? I say, do what you want. Because that element of, cr of editorial freedom, creative freedom, will get the best results. That's my view. And I, you know, I know there's a lot of editors out there that would prefer to write a very detailed brief and tell exact the photographer exactly what shot they want of what person and when. But I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. This cover, and um, it was a bit of a, a departure for us. <coughs> because... Um, it's shot by a photographer called Nadav Kandar. I don't know if anyone knows who Nadav Kandar is, but he's, um, he's, a, he's a very big advertising and commercial photographer, but also a fine art photo photographer. He's very, very successful. And I'd befriended Nadav through cycling. I didn't actually even know who he was. Um, <laughs> it was actually some of my photographer colleagues on the magazine said, do you know who that is? And I was obviously, no, no idea. He, to me, he was just a guy on a bike, and we got chatting. I helped him out with his bike because his, his, uh, his studio was just down the road from our, from our offices. And um, we got to a point where we, 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 we had a job to do. And these hands belong to a, a, an English frame builder called uh, Ron Cooper, who's sadly recently left us. But um, we had to do a shoot with Ron. And um, I couldn't get a photographer to come, and it was very short notice. So I popped down to Nadav's studio and said... Um, would you come and shoot uh, this old boy for us? And he said, yeah, of course, why not? Um, so uh, apart from the fact that I was taken aback that he actually agreed to do it, he then asked me, he said, how would you like me to shoot it? What would you like me to shoot it on? And I said, well, that's kind of up to you because you know, I'm not the one to be telling you how to take photographs. And as a result, we got, we got this cover from, from Nadav, which, um, which was extraordinary. And, um, yeah, one of our one of our departures for uh, from the point of view of using um, uh, a wonderful photographer. <coughs> and speaking of wonderful photographers, um, this was taken by one of our regular contributors, who's actually here with us today, Taz Darling. And um, this was an opportunity that presented itself to us, and that's something that's uh, very important when it comes to editorial freedom. We were actually at a bike race, and we actually had these jerseys in the car. And we found this washing line. We just happened to stumble upon it. This is Provence, and this is during the, the, Paris, uh, the, the, the Dauphiné. Um, and um, it just presented itself to us. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we had that opportunity basically because we had the time and um, the jerseys to do it. And it did refer to something that was in the magazine. So um, all the boxes were ticked from that point of view. So... Um, Editorial freedom, um, for me as well, uh, what's really essential about it is, is that um, creating a magazine is a little bit like creating a collection. And we're here sat amongst this wonderful collection of bicycles. And the best thing about this wonderful collection of bicycles is that they've all been put out so everyone can see them. And as a collector, I know that the collectors, I'm sure, of these bicycles are delighted that their bicycles are actually here for the public to see. And I think as a magazine editor, you have that responsibility as well. And I think what's important with a magazine, and certainly with a magazine that, that, that is uh, involved in such a complicated sport as cycling, is each time the reader opens it, they need to be surprised. They need to have something that they've never seen before. And I think that's important to then not just use photography and to use great writing, but it's also to use illustrators, and in this case, uh, an, il uh, an il English illustrator called uh, Richard Mitchelson, who's worked a lot with us. Um, and I hope that everybody knows what this is, what this, what this image is, but it's from a 1980s uh, cycling jersey for the Z team. And when this came out, there was, a, there was quite a big uh, furore about it because it's, it's a sort of homage to the team, but it's also an homage to Liechtenstein and, and that whole pop art sort of thing. And Richard did a version of it, and nobody had seen it before. So I think from that point of view, we definitely got that bit right. And moving that on, um, 
I've realised that I'm running out of time here slightly, but um, this was uh, a shoot that we did when we left the studio in Kentish Town, and um, we, uh, we we had a conversation about the idea of creating a space that we could actually, you know, basically do what we wanted. And uh, this is actually the shed that was in my garden, and I, I said to uh, to to, the, to Taz, the photographer. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take the, the side of the, the shed off and, and show everybody what's inside the bike shed? That would be brilliant. And as the conversation went on, we said, ah, it'd be better if we actually blew it up. That'd be really good. It'd be really cool if we could just blow the bike shed up and have the whole thing littered all over the place. And then for some bizarre reason, we decided that it would be a really good idea to take this shed and carry it six floors up and, and rebuild it on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at that point, I think it just got a little bit out of hand. Um, <laughs> But it was a very interesting weekend, and I think it was it was it was a uh, because it was a it was a bank holiday weekend like the one you've just got coming up. It was it, we were hoping there was going to be good weather, and it actually chucked it down with rain all weekend. So we were building this shed, and we had a set designer in to help us. You can't really see the detail in the shop when it's projected like this, but the detail is extraordinary. And it was a, it was a big job. It took us two days to prepare it. We had to carry the shed up the outside of the fire escape to get it onto the roof. It took us all day to build it back up on the roof, uh, and it had been raining the whole time. And then at six o'clock in the evening, the sun came out, and uh, everything sort of, the planets aligned, and even the dog ran through the shot at the perfectly at the right time. So, <laughs> so it all worked well. But interestingly, we called this uh, farewell to Perrin Street because we were based in this 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 uh, this office in Perrin Street, and the guy in the in in the, in the workshop is our old accountant who'd left us at the same time. And the dog is obviously, obviously uh, my dog, Gino. And uh, all the bits in the, in the bike shed relate to articles that were in the magazine at the time. Um, I realize I've run over time, but I'm just gonna quickly talk about uh, the next few frames, if that's okay, Richard. Okay, so um <coughs> what I talked about earlier is looking back to go forward. Um, and one of the things that is, uh, surprised me so much and also delighted me as a, as a fan of photography and, a, a, and, and also as a fan of cycling is uncovering a lot of stuff that uh, the picture agencies have and in particular Magnum. Um, we we're very lucky in that Magnum were happy to work with us um, about four or five years ago with a photographer called John Vink who shot the Tour de France in the 80s and it was a beautiful story. I don't know if I don't have those pictures here unfortunately. This is a, sh uh, a photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson. I'm sure you're all familiar with his work, but um, what's extraordinary about this is that this was unpublished in the original story when it, was, when it was published during his lifetime. And Magnum gave us all of the pictures from the, from the rolls of film that Cartier-Bresson took. And when we found this particular shot, we were amazed that, that no one had ever used it before. And when we asked them if we could use it on a cover, which was, again, pretty unheard of, uh, they were they were happy to say yes, and obviously for for a magazine editor that was that was that was a big moment. And when I say looking back to go forward, what's really interesting about looking at old photographs and old stories when you can see all of the pictures that the photographer took is it gives you more freedom because you've got freedom then to actually select the pictures, or maybe all of the pictures, which we did in the case of this Cartier-Bresson shoot. And you can look back on them with uh, the benefit of hindsight, and I think that's a really important element when coming to uh, putting magazines together. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about, um, about distractions because freedom is all about, as I said earlier with Nagasawa, it's all about being kind of slightly belligerent and sticking to your guns and sticking to what you know best. And um, nobody summed that up for me more than this, uh, this fine man, uh, Dino Signori, and if you're familiar with the company Sidi that makes cycling shoes, Dino Signori is the, uh, is the founder and the, and the, the, the owner of Sidi uh, Cycling Shoes. And he said to me, you know, that obviously he started from nothing. He had to support his family. He was a bike racer and he had to um, look after his family because his, his father died. So he had to go out to work and the only thing he knew was, was, was shoemaking. That's what he trained as as a boy. So what he did was he, he, he packed up his, his bike racing aspirations and started making cycling shoes. 
And he started making cycling shoes for his friends and the guys that he'd raced with. And as a result, he gained a reputation. And as a result, he built Sidi. And now Sidi is one of the biggest cycling shoe manufacturers in the world. But I thought what was really interesting about Dino is that he was, he's a very humble man. Um, a very big character, but a very, very humble man. And he said to me, he said, because um, I asked him, I said, do you see yourself as being a businessman, an entrepreneur, if you like, or do you see yourself as being a, a craftsman? And he said, I quite simply see myself as being a shoemaker. And whenever I've seen him at bike races, he's never glad handing it with all the VIPs and all that sort of stuff. He's with the bike racers and he's helping them with their shoes and maybe he's bringing shoes to bring to a bike racer. He's totally absorbed in what he does. And I think that focus gives him complete freedom because he loves what he does. He absolutely adores his job. And not just that, I think he has a very sort of um, holistic view of his business because he says these days, um, most companies, when they get into trouble, or when they start to slow down, they diversify. They go into other areas. They start making different things that they're not used to making. But because they work in cycling, they think they can have a go at, e at everything and anything. And the one thing that City have done and the one thing he's remained true to is focus on what they do. And when they do slow down a bit, he just tells the workers to focus on quality. And I think that's one thing that we miss in this day and age is that quality is the one thing that will shine through. And I think, I don't know, I hope, that's what we do with Rouleur magazine. But sometimes that's, not just, that's just not enough. And we've produced a, uh, a series of books, um, all which I hope... I don't know, is there anybody here from Papercut today? No. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Papercut. Um, they stock our books. I'm just... Get that one in. <laughs> um, al alongside the magazine, uh, the contributors produce an awful lot of work. Um, and so, alongside the magazine, which we've only got so much room in, we produce these books, uh, Photographic Annual and, um, and some uh, historical books. I mean, the, the interesting thing about that, going back to the thing that I was saying earlier about, um, about look, looking back to go forward, and also having the benefit of hindsight, is when we produced this book, Maglia Rosa, by Herbie Sykes, <coughs> we spent... Uh, about three or four days at the, photo, uh, the Olicom uh, photo agency in Milan. <laughs> and and uh, it's, a, it's a good story, actually, because um, we were asking them if they had any more pictures of Fausto Coppi. And they said, well, how many do you want? And I said, well, we'd like to see all of them. And what they'd been doing to that date was bringing some envelopes with some pictures of, of uh, Felice Gimondi or Gina Bartoli or whoever. But when it came to copy, they literally came around the corner with a wheelbarrow. Um, he was possibly the most photographed, I'd say probably the most photographed uh, cyclist ever and probably the most photographed sportsman of his era. And as a result, when we were putting together the Maglia Rosa book, we decided the best thing to do was to, once we finished doing the Maglia Rosa book, was to do a book, a book about faster copy, which we did. And um, it's, it's beautiful. I'm bound to say that. And lastly, I'll leave you with a little bit of advice from Dario Pegaretti, who we started out with. Um, uh, as I say, Dario had a huge influence on, on Rouleau magazine. I don't think he, he probably doesn't realise how much influence he had on it. Um, spending some time with him, watching him build bicycles was, 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 uh, was a very unique experience. Um, and Dario likes a long lunch, a very long lunch, <laughs> usually involving a lot of alcohol. Um, and he's a super guy. Uh, but the last thing he said to me, the last time we were there to, to visit him, he said, uh, drive slowly. And it, he didn't mean drive the car slowly, he just meant in life. Um, and I think that's good advice. Thank you.